Okay, great. So um, maybe briefly about myself. I'm Lucas. I worked um, like three years at Protocol Labs. Before that, I was at BCG and um, for five years, and I did political science in school. So I'm not a technical person, but now I am a technical person because I spend a lot of time like thinking about this stuff. Um, but yeah, I want to um, kind of zoom out. And by the way, Robert, that was a great presentation. I also love like kind of the storytelling around it. I thought it was really cool. I definitely learned something new there, and, and that was really fun. I kind of want to zoom out a bit into describing the space that Filecoin is a part of more generally, right? So that's what we describe as this like decentralized physical infrastructure networks. Um, that is just networks that are comprised of some physical infrastructure that a number of unaffiliated parties contribute. Um, and they do that for all sorts of reasons, primarily because of the chance to get block rewards or some monetizable workloads that they can um, you know, sell to clients. And um, that's kind of what I want to talk about. Filecoin happens to be the largest deepen network kind of in existence. Um, we heard it, right? It was like six exabytes of capacity and um, provides a lot of storage, but it also, by virtue of all these proofs that Robert was also talking about, the proof of replication, the proof of space time, it consumes a lot of um, compute resources. So these six exabytes of um, storage capacity are typically co-located with a lot of compute resources. So really, like there is a whole lot of potential in like both using the storage resource as well as the compute resources for all sorts of um, cool things. Um, I kind of like my entry into this talk, I would say, is kind of talking about how we do um, you know, cloud computing today. Like it's a trillion dollar market, I think, in 2023. 65% um, of that are captured by three companies, right? Google Cloud, Azure, um, and, uh, and AWS. Um, that's, that's kind of a problem because they charge, I mean, they, they build great products, but they also charge very high prices, unnecessarily high prices, you might say, um, because they have this monopoly on the tooling that just locks people in, right? Like once you're there, you use that tooling and it's very hard to migrate vendors. Um, that's, they have built great products, they're super useful, we use them every day, all the time. Um, but I would argue that having such kind of closed ecosystems stifles innovation, right? You just have fewer people who can think about, you know, great new products and, and all of that. And um, yeah, that, so there is just an opportunity here to both tap into a huge market um, and, and kind of break these oligopolies and bring more innovation, bring down cost and make this accessible to a lot more opportunities and not just, you know, like the things that we use it for today. And that's kind of where Deepin comes in. And um, you already, I would argue, right, this is like the thesis that I'm putting out that a lot of the, what the centralized cloud offers today, right, like lambdas and uh, machine learning inference, snark circuit generation, video encoding, rendering, all these like are compute workloads that currently typically run on the cloud and run on tools that have been built by AWS, et cetera. And we see in kind of crypto and Web3, all these like projects popping up that tackle very specific types of compute workloads, right? Like Fluence is kind of Docker containers run on, you know, run with cryptographic proofs on, on blockchain. You have Jensen, Aleo, Live, Peer, Render. I expect there will not be whatever, five of these networks, there will be probably hundreds or thousands of these networks that all you know, basically build protocols, or you can think of it in the conventional sense as, as like products that replace things that the cloud today does or that maybe augment what the cloud does today. Um, and what these networks do is they define the workload. They say, you know, this is what a Lambda function is, or this is what video rendering has to do. Then they figure out how to validate the successful completion of these workloads, right? And you can do two ways. You can either, like in the case of like Bitcoin, basically plug in the nonce into your equation and see if the result is correct. Or you can do it probabilistically, um, where you basically challenge people um, randomly, and if they um, didn't provide the right, if they didn't provide the right execution, then they will get slashed and lose some collateral or something. So different ways of doing it. Um, these networks will then also create tooling for developers to kind of put these things together, and ideally they will be completely like cross compatible and just kind of composable. So you have all these different components. They will typically also provide or define what a provider will get in recognition of executing a workload, right? And it's typically block rewards and 
They might have different kind of inflation schedules or money supply logics that they follow there. Um, and then, um, yeah, like through virtue of having, having all these uh, kind of distributed ledgers, you also have payments that you can facilitate between different parties. So Deepin as the solution to a centralized cloud, um, but also at the very early stages, because you're still defining a lot of these workloads and networks are kind of trying to figure out how to best do that. Deepin is hard, right? Like right now you have no tooling, you have you're working with providers that are unaffiliated, right? Like that could be Robert with the whatever computer in his basement and a data center somewhere in France. And like, how do you get these folks to work together in a way that like actually makes sense and you can like trust that what you're sending to those networks is executed, right? So that's, and coordinating them. You don't have control over providers, you just have incentives. There's no legal contracts that you can enforce. So you really have to make sure that your like incentive model works. Um, they're unreliable, right? Like they, they might go down, whatever, something gets flooded. So you have to be able to reproduce capacity that you're building up. And um, yeah, there's just, they're all across the globe. So you're dealing with different jurisdictions and all these different things, which make it much harder than like building something like this in a centralized way, right? Like Apple is a great example where they can just like develop the tooling with a five year strategic plan and really make sure it all works. Um, and so like even with Firecoin, and maybe just kind of to tie that, like it does have multiple flaws, right? Like Firecoin I think is a great idea and I loved spending and I still spend a lot of my time thinking about how to make it work. Right now it works primarily for archival use cases. The tooling maturity is not great, I would say. So it doesn't quite feel like AWS yet or like using an S3 or some, something like that, but we're getting closer. And um, you also have the, the act of writing data to Filecoin is hard, right? That's the sealing process with the proof of replication. Like it's complex, it can be expensive. Um, and then you have this collateral that you require to put up to ensure good behavior, which adds like financial complexity, right? So you're, a Filecoin storage provider has to deal with all of this, right? And even still, you know, we can see that there's like XX, I, I think that number is like just slightly older, maybe like it still has eight exabytes of capacity or six exabytes of capacity. There's still over 3000 storage provider systems in the network. It is the largest deep network in existence. And um, you know, Robert said it, there's almost 2 million terabytes of data stored on the network. So even though it's kind of hard and clunky and difficult, we still see this kind of adoption, which to me is just such a strong like point to show that like we're we're onto something interesting here. Because I think like the benefits are also pretty obvious, right? Like it's open, you have resiliency because you're not trusting one centralized party. You're actually trusting kind of a swarm of different providers to store data or to do compute for you. Um, you have all this crazy like innovation happening where providers on the network compete with each other for clients, for tooling, for kind of making it more useful. It's an open market where you have, you know, much more competition on prices and price setting. And you have this crazy mechanism to incentivize otherwise unaffiliated, unaffiliated actors to actually come together, right? Like Filecoin as a cloud storage solution is actually a network of a bunch of providers that compete with each other, but they towards the external world can kind of like offer this one thing. And then you have, um, yeah, you kick off these economic flywheels where with block rewards, you can actually bootstrap into existence a network that required many hundreds of millions of dollars of real capital spending in the real world to just kind of make them exist, right? Like standing up 1% of global storage, cloud storage capacity in 18 months is insane, right? Like, and like all these hardware vendors, Seagate, Western Digital, look at them, they're like, how? Like, who is this like entity that's suddenly spending hundreds of millions of dollars? And the answer is it's not one entity, it's just a network of unaffiliated parties that are kind of coordinated by a protocol. So super, super powerful. Um, I now work with um, a company that's kind of democratizing the process of creating and capturing value on these networks. And what I mean by that is like, it is hard to participate in Filecoin. It's also hard and participate some of these other networks, right? Like Jensen, Fluence, Alio, et cetera. Um, and that kind of like prevents this from really kicking into gear, right? Like if you make it, if the areas to, if the barriers to participate in these networks are very high, 
it's just unlikely that more people will participate. And so we try to do that. And one thing that I kind of want to briefly highlight is this idea that also Robert already said, right? Like you always have like for providers on these networks, like ultimately two sources of revenue. Um, you have block rewards that typically decay over time, right? Like just in the case of Bitcoin, you have it in the case of the Ficon network, it's a kind of a function of time passing as well as the total size of the network. It's there's like it's a but it like ultimately the minting curve always like kind of slopes down. Um, and what you're trying to do on the other hand, or kind of simultaneously ramp up um, kind of revenue from other um, from the services, right? Like because you're providing storage. So ideally you have this bootstrapping phase at the beginning where people rely on block rewards to finance their operations. But at the same time, they're building all the tooling, they're building a client base, and so they're ramping up revenue from network participants as opposed to just relying on revenue from the network itself. Um, we try, you know, ultimately, like, that gets you to something like this, right, where you layer your block rewards in orange that kind of decay over time, and then you add a little green pile on top with, like, revenue from real storage clients and like over time like even though your block words decay and um, you can build you can use that kind of money to grow into actually like a profitable business and you're just kind of like sloping up overall in the total revenue that you can generate um, and yeah like this allows actually the block words are just a mechanism to build to allow deep end providers to build a real business but like ultimately like once the block words basically disappear or they, you know, like a pro asymptotically approach on an exponential decay function zero, um, you still have another business and you're like now in this different world. And that's just like kind of what Deepin tries to get you to and what you use these block words for. How, like how we do this is kind of like we have, we have all these networks, right? Filecoin, Fluence, bunch of others. Um, these networks like issue, how do I activate the laser pointer? I'm not sure. Anyways, like these networks like send rewards, right? Like they say, um, if, if you execute this workload, you get a certain number of block rewards. At the same time, they also like, you know, generate workloads that are monetizable, right? So for Filecoin, it's like, I provide you one terabyte of storage and like somebody is probably willing to pay for that. Um, on the other side, you have people that provide capital. Um, this could be, you know, folks, stakers, we typically call them. They would be the ones that basically provide the collateral um, that is used to secure the commitment against these networks. And then you have hardware providers that are providing drives, circuits, networking, equipment, whatever. And if you take these two together, which is kind of what we do, right, we combine the capital of token holders with the hardware of hardware owners Together, we turn that into a resource that is actually committed to these networks. In result, we get rewards for executing the jobs or we pass those rewards back to the you know, people that uh, provide the collateral and then the workloads kind of get passed to the hardware providers who can then build these like businesses that I was kind of describing, right? Where they're, where they're building the green curve. I'll skip this. I think what's interesting here, this is the hash power graph of Bitcoin, another interesting chart. Um, you see that if you have very simple jobs, right, like where you really break it into pretty, right, like the nonce thing is like pretty simple, the function or the problem that you're actually trying to solve, it's just a question of how many resources you throw at it. And then you have this really interesting competition because you have, with the cr price of Bitcoin increasing, you have, you're still solving the same problem, it's just you, who, who can solve it fastest, right? And so now you have this really interesting chart where people are increasing how much like hashing power they throw at the problem to accelerate how quickly they can solve the, the block problem basically. And you see that like with simple jobs in a proof of work setting and competition, you actually get crazy performance increases to the point where people build like application specific circuits circuits to just build the Bitcoin problem as opposed to using like off the shelf hardware. And this is something that like needs to be re replicated for Deepin, which it isn't, right? Because in Deepin it is much harder. You have all this storage, you have all these complex things. And so like one thing that I truly believe is like, how can we make it work for Deepin? We have to really make it simple. And, and break these workloads into their component pieces, split the role of hardware provider from capital provider, 
and then you're getting to something interesting and you will see a replication of charts like this where suddenly you see a bunch of providers compete to build crazy specific hardware that's hyper efficient um, and then you're actually beginning to compete with the you know breadth and scale effects and and all of that that you see from the hyperscalers today so that's kind of the future that i think we'll get to and with that i'll stop we're we're hiring like if anybody of you is like a smart contract engineer send me a note or just generally interested um so yeah um happy happy to chat unfortunately i have to leave in like two minutes but um yeah thanks thanks Thank for you. coming